So what we do with Reup is that we cut out the middleman. It's kind of like still the a street cut concept. We cut out the middleman, the Wall Street investment bankers, the underwriter intermediaries, and we go directly, we bring offerings or securities directly to the public. So we like to say um, we can get you in on the crop that they won't share. Mm. Yeah. We're, we're totally your back office. We handle all the, the business of cannabis for you and manage that. Mm. Train, hire, fire, all of that. The record keeping, the taxes, and so on and so on. And if your expertise was growing cannabis, that can remain your expertise. When lions are historians, tales of the hunt will no longer favor the, the hunter. hunter. Even though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakyan. We're on site at the beautiful New West Summit. We are now going to be talking with Melek Dexter. Hi, Melek. How you doing? Thank you so much for coming on the show. No problem. Really Thank you appreciate for having it. Me. I'm so pumped for this conversation. Melek is the CEO and founder of ReUp, <coughs> and his background so interesting here. The dexterous understanding of racial dynamics moved him to found ReUp, which is a crowdsourced startup that leverages diversity as a competitive differentiator in the cannabis industry. And it's been cool. Think. I heard that this is part of the slogan, and I talked to you about this a bit in the green room, but from the streets to the boardroom. I love that a lot. Um, we got a lot to unpack here. Let's talk about you first. You know, who are you? How did you even get started on this journey? Okay, uh, again, thank you for being, for allowing me to be here. Um, my name is Dex Melik Dexter, and uh, the way I came about this is, is really organic in the sense of, um, I found myself in search of, I would call like a cure. My older brother had a scar on his brain, or has a scar on his brain. And um, later in life, he developed these seizures. And we were told that one day, ultimately, they will kill him. So um, I began uh, my trek you know, to the West Coast from the South, Atlanta, and in search of what I had been hearing is this oil that you know, could treat that. And we were very aware of just how, how vicious, you know, the uh, regular conventional medicine, you know, was. So um, I found it and began to, my brother, older brother had smoked weed all his life, but that didn't seem to affect the situation. So um, after a while of treating himself, you know, with strong THC, you know, content oil in those early days, uh, the seizures went like from mild to to not happening. So um, while out there, you know, but what I saw, I had never seen anything like it. I saw Humboldt County, and at that time it was uh, very white, and um, and and I I'm I I was raised in a way where I'm very keen to racial dynamics. You know, I think it feeds into everything. You know, whether we see it, say it, or, or not, it's there. And so I noticed that the black people in Humboldt wouldn't make eye contact, and I, I assumed that that was, I don't want to mess up my plug, you know. So over time of buying and selling, you know, while I was out there, um, I realized that I was in the game, and, and my white counterparts were in, in business. I was selling weed, and they were selling cannabis. And um, so I knew that wasn't going to end well for me, and I was not going to be on the cover of a magazine as a result of you know my prowess and ac business acumen. I was going to wear you know some county orange somewhere, and so um, with that being the case, I knew personally I knew enough people who looked like me, and didn't fit the the, the drug dealer stereotype. And so that's what found it, that's what led me to say, we've got to rethink this. My father always told me, you know, we have to outthink their thinkers. And so I began the process of outthinking. And um, that led ultimately <clears throat> to, um, to, you know, realizing in 2012, uh, President Obama introduced the Jobs Act. And the significance of that is that prior to 2012, 
you could not, if you were, unless you were an accredited investor with a net worth of a million dollars or an earning, a yearly earning of $250,000, you couldn't invest into private equity companies. And private equity companies could not raise money from that group of people who were less than that. And so this was a game changer in, in how, you know, smaller companies could, could crowdfund, fund, yeah. how they could raise money. R differing from like a Series A, Series B, you had the Regulation Ds and the Reg As and so on and so on. So we thought to leverage the marijuana in industry by using these, these, uh, these, these personal offering exemptions, private offering exemp exemptions and how to raise capital. So what we do with REUP is that we cut out the middleman. It's kind of like still the, a street cut concept. We cut out the middleman, the Wall Street, investment bankers, the underwriter intermediaries, and we go directly, we bring offerings or securities directly to the public. So we like to say um, we can get you in on the crop that they won't share. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oof. Okay, so first this, uh, I love the perception that you have. You have this perspective when you get into Humboldt that you see that it's either I'm in the game or I'm in the business. And I love that first, that perception is, hey, I want in on the business. I want to democratize these fruits that are about to come from the emerging cannabis market to to black people. I want to democratize them to women. I want to democratize them to people that typically don't actually get the privilege of reaping the best parts of the emerging market fruits. Mm -hmm. And that's such a critical part of the conversations that we've been having. And this other one is about, you know, microfinancing. That part's so crucial as well. People that only have 10 bucks, 100 bucks, 1000 bucks, can they get in on the emerging market? And how can we most easily make the regulatory frameworks that enable that style of process? Well, well our approach is, um, I think it's very fair and also unique in the sense that um, we operate from a, a, a very conscious position of knowing that at 33 states now having legalized in some shape or form, you know, cannabis, that if no one stopped at the halfway mark to say, oh my God, we've left out you know, black people again, even though they suffered from the war on drugs, then that's the business as usual. Yeah. So operating with that type of consciousness, we're very specific in not trying, in, in, we're very specific in our plan as to what we want to do. So individuals with uh, $10 or whatever, we're encouraging them you know, to put their monies together, to pool their resources, even amongst their own, you know, yes, networks. Yes. And, uh, and to go larger, yeah. you know, in an effort to, to reap the windfall of this, this, you know, this big industry. The, mindful, the mindset change um, from that, that extra uh, hundred dollars being used on a material possession that is just trying to be in a sense, just conspicuously flaunted, uh, rather than investing that into the long game, into this big game, into emerging market. This is financial literacy. So many people actually, um, you know, Damon John has been stepping up and talking about this a lot recently, these financial literacy things that were not taught so much in school, but especially can we get the, the young black kids around the United States to really latch into that and yeah. yeah well let me say this about it um, it's not financial illiteracy that's the assumption when we talk about the need to teach financial literacy it's not that there's a illiteracy we have to be mindful that there is, there's always been a plan to create a vulnerable population to be exploited and in this country it's black people as, as the primary target so it's not we're not combating this is not a matter of fighting illiteracy. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a game. I was not, I didn't have the choice to choose the game or the business. I was doing business. You know, I'm a, I'm a very highly educated person, but n regardless of me doing the same transaction, I was put in the game based upon my race. So the concept of illiteracy is, is where you're socially designated. So our mission is not to create, you know, financial literacy, it's to give the opportunity. 80% of the marijuana that, that is grown in California prior to just a few years ago left California. And, and I would venture, 
because the data is only you know uh, empirical, I would venture that a large amount of that marijuana left California through highly sophisticated networks that black people ran. This is why you have to look at, I think uh, Baron Rothschild made mm. this statement that, okay. you know, at the Battle of Waterloo, that, that you invest when there's blood in the streets. But people only stop, you know, at that point. The reality is he said that you invest when there's blood in the streets even if it's your own. Uh. So the blood in the streets in America today is the, the highness arrest rates and how disproportionate that is of black to everyone else. Yeah. But there's a way to look at that as, as a business person. If black people nationwide are five times more likely to be arrested with marijuana, then what that really means, you could, there's a discrimination position that can be taken in social justice. But there's another side of a person reading the, the market. What that simply means is that black people got weed. Mm -hmm. You see? Yeah. So that 80% that leaves means that we actually were responsible for a large part of the marijuana industry and the way that it moved, the way that it was trafficked, and the way that it was distributed. So the effects of the legalization process across the country and it systematically shutting us out is akin to a national campaign to gentrify our networks of distribution and create the Walmart effect, meaning that when Walmart hits your city, mom and pops die. die. And so that's what's happening now. And then with the way social equity is playing out is that we're losing what we were already doing to the first move advantage you know, of white wealthy males. So it's not, it's not really about illiteracy. That's, the, that's a, a knee-jerk reaction yeah. you know, of not being really in tune. It's, it's actually an insulting position. Thank you for yeah. educating me more on that. Mm -hmm. That's really strong, actually. So, okay, so we have this uh, history of rules and regulations and just overall game plans that have put certain populations of people at disadvantages from this growing pot of wealth that's being created. And then furthermore is that, you know, these lines actually really resonate with me. It's, you know, Ye has a line where he says that, meanwhile, the DEA teamed up with the CCA, mm -hmm. Corporate Corrections of America. And so when you have things like that happening, you see these greater incarceration rates, you educate us here about the distribution network. If the distribution network is more black, why is there not inclusive stakeholding that is making it so that they mm -hmm. reap the rewards of the distribution? That, that's the literacy that we're teaching. I like this a lot. Mm -hmm. So rather than having this massive conglomerate that's owned by white male America coming in and and having the Walmart effect happen how do we make the process where the distribution networks have inclusive stakeholding added to them as quickly as possible so that way we can uh, have that this literacy in a sense movement happen if inclusive stakeholding which then makes it so that people can reap the benefits of the fruits of the emerging market I don't think it can be done you know, and I don't think that's the incentive. There is no financial, you know, upside of doing that for the people. You, the, the purpose of business in capitalism is that you win and some, a greater amount of people lose. That's, that's the way it's based. So I don't think that that system is meant to be undone, and it certainly won't be undone by the people who are benefiting from it. But the so, pie is always growing, and it's just the, the, the m majority of the people that are investing in the pie earlier are reaping m most of the fruits. Meanwhile, the bottom is just very slowly coming up in terms of basic needs yeah, being met. That's what's happening, but there's no, there's no precedent of any industry doing that. I mean, you can look at the alcohol industry, right? Um, I forget the guy's name. Uh, what was the brother's name who, with the Jack Daniels? Yes. You know, this, this, this guy who literally taught Jack Daniels how to create the brew. Ma Malcolm? Uh, Nearest. Uh, Mal Malcolm Nearest. Malcolm Nearest. Okay. And so after all this time, they're giving him a brand, but they're not going back in, in, in retrospect, you know, in retroactively adding that up and giving him any type of, you know, repairing. Like it's nothing, nothing happened best. like that. So there's no precedent in any industry, you know, where someone has gone and done that. So what REUP's position is, is that we are not, we're our own social equity program. We're going to leverage 
the JOBS Act and take securities directly to the community at large and not just the wealthiest in our networks. You know, we don't need 5,000 licenses, you know, like, like the, the big MSOs or anything like that. We just need what we're able to obtain in that industry, in this industry, and then we can redistribute wealth amongst ourselves and then establish that. Yeah. Do you guys? Near screen. The, his name is Near Screen. N-I-E-R? N-E, like nearest. And Nathan Nearest Green. Oh, Nearest Green. Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. So Nearest, Nathan Nearest Green. Interesting. Okay. Uh, was a blackhead stiller, commonly referred to now as a master distiller. Born into slavery, emancipated after the Civil War, he's known as the master distiller who taught distilling techniques to Jack Daniel, founder of the Jack Daniel Tennessee Whiskey Distillery. So, Nearest Green, as a master distiller, taught Jack Daniel the techniques that are now literally known as one of the most popular whiskeys. And where is the inclusive stakeholding for the, exactly. near, for the nearest family? Exactly. Um, so stuff like that, this, these are the points yeah. to make. So there's no historical precedent of that. And then we can go back to the numbers game in, in Harlem, you know, which when licensing came into effect, it left from, it, start, it stopped being a, a black thing and became, you know, owned by the state. We can go back to gambling, which was thriving in the Chicago, the Detroits, and all these places. Then it became Las Vegas. It's, it's, that's the process. So that's part of the literacy that you refer to is that we, we need to remind, you know, black people in the presence. In other words, we're centering blackness, you know, and the, and the black plight in our conversations. And when we talk to audiences mm. outside of ours, mm. that's where the illiteracy takes place. Mm. Because we have to remind you that this is where these things started. And I'm sure as you do your research, we all do our research, we're going to find a, a nearest, you know, in, yeah. the, in the cannabis industry. We yes. know Cheech, Cheech and yes. Chong, the whole stereotype, yeah. is about a swarthy looking person who most likely is, is Hispanic and or other, mm -hmm. but not the typical, atypical, you know, white male. Yeah. So then you got Bob Marley, Peter Tosh. It's yeah. just the way hip hop in a few years won't look like the, it's not run by the originators of it. So we're not, our program is simply very clear and transparent. And it's not to say that, you know, white people cannot support or anything like that. You're, you're supporting us by helping us get the message out. So we're just centering black so that we can have a real conversation about what's really happening, what really has happened, and use the historical precedent of has there ever been any desire to socially, you know, make people equal. Yeah. Yes, and yes. I say, no, it hasn't. And could, you know, re-up in other movements that are focusing on this inclusive stakeholding, leveraging um, the the uh, being able to take and break down the what used to be just a million dollar investment into such smaller components enabling that yes. equity is massive. Also there was the um, the we were doing this more and more actually it's coming up not only here in the conversation um, with nearest 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 green Nathan nearest green mm -hmm. but also uh, it the the unknown the unknown heroes the one with the three NASA computers the 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 females that were computers mm -hmm. yeah uh, is that what was the movie again um, something un, faces uh, un hidden um, something. oh hidden figures I think That's right it, hidden figures. hidden figures the hidden figures yes so hidden figures was another great example of this so this is also a call in terms of you teaching us about literacy it's teaching, it's getting people more excited to learn about where were these unknown hidden figures in the past that have literally moved fields forward that never got to reap the rewards for themselves and their families mm -hmm. along the way. And so I love that point, that's critical. So now let's talk about the framework of re-up. Sure. So yeah, so how exactly um, are, did you guys figure out to, to be able to make it easily accessible for people and how are you marketing yourself so people know about you and then changing their mind to invest in? Well, the SEC, as we know, the Securities Exchange Commission is a highly regulated entity. So we plan on doing this with what's called a Reg A Tier 2 raise. 
capital raise. And what that means is that um, reg reggae a plus. Reg A tier two. Re reggae plus tier reggae two. Reggae plus tier two. And okay. that gives us the ability to, to raise capital from accredited and non-accredited individuals up to the point of $50 million in a 12-month period. So our plan is, um, there's another concept in the, in the SEC, whenever you do capital raises with non-accredited people, there's a great assumption. And the SEC uses the word sophisticated investor. It makes the, the, a, a very racialized statement that wealthy people are sophisticated or smart. So, and then it, there's a requirement that these individuals have to have a relate, you have to have a pre-existing relationship with them in order to raise the money. So we've created something like an investment syndicate, uh, an online community tool. We're in the process of creating that. And so when we invite people in, there's a process of, of education, orientation, exposure to conversations like this. Like through a series of videos or educational yes. materials. Kind of like a master class. Master class. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So uh, yeah. individuals learn more about the type of investment their actual origins and their stake that that was in the industry as originators, such as Nearest Green, those kind mm -hmm. of examples. And so um, when we, after a period of time of doing that and networking with these individuals, we've been traveling to the cities. So the plan is roughly, you know, 10 cities, I'm calling them chocolate cities, pe cities where predominantly there's a strong, you know, black uh, population. And the reason for that is that as legalization has moved from the West, we noticed that it started or it moved very quickly to recreational. Mm. But as it's moving to the Midwest and to the South, it, it starts as medicinal. And, and so that medicinal within itself, adding to the, uh, the already existing almost non-negotiable barriers of entry, the fact that it's medicinal makes it very difficult too because then the prereq is that you would have, to be an operator, have, would have had to have massive public health experiment, experience dealing with an entire state. So that rules out, you know, mom and pops or another black individual who just got money, who has money. So um, we're watching that and we're noticing that. So a way for us to, to you know, to counter that situation mm -hmm is by pooling the monies nationwide. So what we've doing, done is we've looked at like 10 cities and the goal is if we could raise up, we're not locked into this because we have different denominations of people's ability to mm -hmm. contribute. But roughly, just so we can show how doable the number is, yeah. the 50 million is, yep. in 10 cities, a thousand people who give $5,000, yeah. that's $50 yeah. million. Dollars. Yeah. And then we invest with those individuals. Let's say a company. 10 cities, 1,000 people, $5,000. That's 50 million. That's. So you, now we have yeah. buying power. There it is. And We're our own yeah. social equity program as oh, opposed to waiting yeah. for what takes place. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's, that's the process. And we function not as an MSO, but something like a, a CMO, a cannabis management organization. Mm. You see in the dental industry, there's uh, DSOs. And what they do is they provide um, uh, back office you know, services and management services, hiring, firing, re human resource, and so on and so on, yeah. to dental offices. And so that's the service we'll perform because most individuals who were in the game, now ready to get into the business, they grew it, they sold it. Yeah. You know, the, that's a different you know, thing with all the regulation and the accounting and the compliance. So that's what we provide for those individuals who, who have the license. Because right now what's happening in social equity is that the license are literally purchasable if you obtain them by the bigger companies. Mm -hmm. And they keep a black face out for the purpose of black face to sustain the, the, the equity licenses. So that's how REUP will roll out. And so we have a, we kind of, uh, I think we, we, we serve a greater purpose by not taking over a person's business, but we're, we provide support. So yeah, that's, that's the ambition, that's the goal. Epic, so then 10 cities, 
a thousand people in each city, five thousand dollars to get in. You guys handle this back office work, so they don't have to worry so much. You handle the educational piece, the master class piece as they get in, so they better understand what's going. CMO, cannabis management organization, organization. Mm -hmm. and then what happens with the fund with the fifty million? How does that get uh, allocated for uh, ensuring excellent returns? Right. Well, um, let's say you you have a license. Uh, we we've had several offers from different places so far that we're actually considering and having conversations with. Let's say in Michigan right now or Chicago, you have a cultivation license and and processing or extraction license. What we would do is we would we would assist. We would create a contract or negotiate what the relationship is. And hypothetically speaking, let's say. We will purchase the equipment for ex extraction. We will bring, you know, highly trained personnel from who know how to extract in compliance with that particular ordinance or that state, you know, uh, regulation. And we would provide that training. We would provide the the uh, the the setup, the negotiate the lease of the of the particular real estate that you're using. Mm -hmm. We're we're totally your back office. We handle all the, the business of cannabis for you and manage that. Mm. Train, hire, fire, all of that. The record keeping, the taxes, and so on and so on. And if your expertise was growing cannabis, that can remain your expertise. And then that and you becomes still a part of the re-up process. So everyone that's doing their thing in the cannabis industry that also puts in it's a joint venture. It's a like. joint venture so between we're all those people. That That's it. From the, all those cities. Yes. And you manage like a macro perspective of what's happening between growers and, f Ex and dispensaries mm -hmm. and re the real estate side and yes. the transactions and then giving people dividends as you guys. Exactly. Yeah. We handle all of that in. So our investor pool reaps the benefits of us making sure that we manage you know the the bottom line of that business who may never have had to to deal with the regular regulatory aspects of growing cannabis extracting cannabis making edibles selling edibles we handle those those parts to keep them in compliance because uh, it's 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 highly regulated it's highly regulated everywhere people it, it's manifesting differently matter of fact in Georgia where we have what's called HB 324 there are no dispensaries. It's going to be, uh, the product will be dispensed through pharmacies. What? Which is, which is. In the whole state of Georgia? In the whole state of Georgia. There so are no dispensaries. It's going to be dispensed through pharmacies? Yeah, so how that's going to roll out, we, no one has any ideas. I don't even know if they have. Who wrote that legislation <laughs> is another good question. Yeah. Who's behind that and why? Like, what's the. What's the agenda behind that? Because but once again, yeah. that manifests as an interestingly difficult yeah. barrier to entry yeah. for that, that black city. So, um, you know, we have black pharmacists, you know, so we're just watching how it goes. But the, I think the most significant thing about REUP is that we're a, a campaign, a business, a movement of, of readiness. And readiness is, is, is interesting because we participated in the early stages of, or, or as a witness to the early stages of the social equity program in Oakland and um, in San Francisco. My critique of these model social equity programs is that they are, they're, they're going to, the time it takes for them to have, for them to, to, to activate what they want to do, to create social equity, the game is so far ahead, you know, it's so far gone. It's, it's beyond, you know, smoking or whatever. So therefore, like I think you mentioned, or I've heard people at the conference mention, you know, Snoop and, and other rappers and such that the only way for us to participate in the legal industry is like, as though it was still illegal. In other words, we participate as, in my opinion, as caricature in this business, in this industry. Whereas our imagery is still about, you know, how high we can get and how blowed we are when we're doing something, as opposed to the medicinal aspects of it, the high science related to it, yeah. and the high tech that's going to be needed, you know, in it. And so 
like literally if Snoop was just way more on the health and wellness side or more on the uh, high science um, side or on the, hey, go and put in the 5K into re-up side of things. Uh, yes, we, we yeah. would love that, you know, our celebrities, those individuals who can kick, catch, throw and jump, you know, sing, dance, rap, yeah. would, you know, join us. And, and we have individuals who are in the process of doing that as influencers to move us to this particular space. And, um, and let's see what we can do when we do what we need to do. Yeah. Wow, that whole, the whole idea of this, the caricature is just, it's, it's actually permeating into all different types of people's spirits. Uh, like, uh, y y really, it's, it's about just this, like, inability for creative flourishing to be uh, optimized. Like I see, I see this happening time and time again with emerging markets that instead of having immediately from the ground up these, um, the, the, the storytelling is everything in this scenario. And if you can storytell in a way that um, lights fires under people's butts to want to um, f uh, endeavor into the emerging market m uh, more optimally towards the health and wellness side or towards the high tech and high science side or towards the investment side, it's just that's what catalyzes the snowball effect. They tell yeah. their friends and stuff, mm -hmm. but it's about the stories initially. So actually these, these memes that you paint uh, about what could be are actually one of the key seeds that need to happen. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a story that needs to be told. And uh, it's no offense to the brothers who are doing what they're doing. It's just simply, it's not personal at them. It's just simply, you have a greater voice and a greater influence. You know, brothers like Killer Mike and, and T.I., those individuals, and then I understand that Jay-Z is, is in the business as well. Mm -hmm. That's what needs to happen to bring another influence in towards, you know, higher social justice issues and even adding the economic, you know, the opportunity for economic and generational wealth as an issue of social justice, which it is. You know, the right of self-determination is a social justice issue. So um, I would like to see more of us turn from signing our names and receiving a check as opposed to, you know, equitized, being equitized, you know, but also to source the, the companies that are out here that are black and, and, and lend their celebrity to them and let's move this thing forward as real influencers because hip hop is the prime example. You know, no one was thinking of, of touching a record and moving it back and forth and, and creating a sound and then, but look at what it became. It became a, a privately held billion dollar industry then, and ultimately it was appropriated and now it is what it is. So the precedent of what we can create is, is clearly there, but also the precedent of what happens, you know, once we create is, is there also. So we have to be mindful of that. That's what REUP is about, you know, reminding us that we did it, we can do it, and what a beautiful place it would be to do it again. And so. Yeah. You know, when I have these conversations in the presence of, of white people, I, um, my, I'm always asked, you know, so what can we do? My, my answer is that you can support, and you can support, you can watch, you can not work against mm -hmm. what's taking place, because it's inevitable that black people will not wait for social equity, but don't check yourself to not feel threatened by black people owning their own culture. Yeah. It's natural for a group of people to own their own culture. So what we're simply doing is we're fractionalizing the asset of black culture and our relationship to this plant. And we're rewiring our, our, our reaction to it as being you know, victims to it, to having victory over it and creating it into, creating an opportunity for generational wealth. And so what I'm saying to you know, our white peer is that when that happens, you get to experience this once in a lifetime opportunity of the legalization of marijuana. You get the once in a lifetime opportunity to be on the right side of history mm -hmm. and not allow this to black people having wealth and controlling their wealth to not feel threatening to you. Ooh. So I like the I like the idea of creating the generational wealth by in this sense fractionalizing and saying, okay, 
black community, let's get ourselves together and the pieces that we need together in order to be able to take on this emerging market and take on the, the exponential curve that's coming in to make it so that we can reap the fruits of this and make it so that our kids and their kids get the benefits of what is to, I, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of also the way that you just portray the, the like, don't feel fear about the pie growing and people uh, stepping in that are, in a sense, different from you. Whether it be, we just came back from three weeks of partnership interviews in China, and there's way too much uh, crap happening about, people haven't even visited the countries before. And there's hatred flying around. Mm. It's like, you don't, you gotta go and visit, make friends, and then you'll see how this is love. Mm -hmm. It's love. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you, and then it's all, and then it's like, let China have their growing pie. Let black America have their growing pie. And also grow your own and your family's pies as well. And just, uh, and th th that mentality of not having fear around that, but rather having vast abundance that just is just so big that it's able to be shared with everyone is, uh, that's the future that we want to go. Plus there's the average, the, the median age in Africa right now is 18. Yeah, yeah. And that market, it, again, it's like, what are you going to do with a billion people, especially young people that, have the, youth. Yeah. that have the creative potential to, to uh, take care of things like the massive rainforest in the Congo that have the potential to do things like leverage all of the incredible natural resources that are in the the continent of Africa, but also the um, the creative potential of all the philosophical, the scientific ideas that are about to erupt from mm -hmm. it as well. So, what are your thoughts about about that? I'm interested to hear what you think about that. I think that as it relates to Africa, I think that um, Africa is the central ground for for the future. I think that Africans in the hemi in the Western Hemisphere are the most integral people to the future of Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, and not to make the continental African, you know, my brothers and sisters insignificant. I'm saying that the coming home, you know, process, the meeting of those two persons, when we began to share notes, yeah. it's going to be a, a massive thing. And I think the, the rest of the world is going to have to watch. There's an interesting zeitgeist that's taking place, you know, whether you agree with Obama's politics or not. A black man as the leader of the quote unquote free world is highly symbolic. Yeah. My daughter grew up when there was a black president. She doesn't even know anything about that there was, it could be anything else. Spider Man is black in her lifetime. So it's a different philosophy, and we, we're yet to see the effects of that, but we're kind of seeing it. Even again, back to hip hop, individuals have figured it out. I don't need to sign a contract. I will point and click and make this video and then I will tour and I will earn money. Mm. People are, are cutting out the, mm. the, this, this, this slavery process. And uh, big, big America, corporate America hasn't figured it out yet. And so Africa, I always use the analogy about Africa in this sense, that Africa emerged on the cell phone game when it was digital. Mm -hmm. Never experienced analog. Yeah. So we're, we just don't have the cameras pointed at Africa, you know, to see just how, how creative the, the African intellect. We're the first people on the planet. At this point, nobody denies that, except, you know, Bubba and a couple other guys, you know, and other people who can't relate, you know. But there's something to be said about that, a lot to be said. So I think Africa is, is by necessity becoming its own thing. It's like the, the quote unquote, mod, the modern world, the more progressive world is, is running at a breakneck speed and it's Africa's wisdom to not try and catch up or feel that it's outdated. It's to let them go ahead and crash into what they're doing. And since you mentioned an international view, mm -hmm. I think it was the president of Brazil, Da Silva, he was making a comment some years ago about the whole the world banking -ish -ish institution that crippled the world for a moment there, you know. And he said that he didn't, he didn't know any black or brown bankers. He said this world has been brought to his knees by, by blue-eyed males because they 
portrayed that they understood and knew what they were doing and didn't. I only say that to say is that, to answer your question, that Africa is the future, but it's not an Africa under, you know, this, this, um, this new age colonial idea of Africa. Not another scramble. No, nah. yeah. yeah. it, it's, it's an Africa that, that's thinking clearly and thinking and centering Africa in all of its endeavors. So you can't hold back, you know, a nation of, of youth who are, who are, who are you, that's what youth does, it creates. So yes. I think it's the largest population <clears throat> of a continent of youth in the world. Yeah. So there's no way that the yeah. world can be the same with, with that being the new influencers. I so that's my take. I love that. I love yeah. your perspective on the, the sharing of notes. That will be so beautiful oh, when, yeah. that, when that mm -hmm. happens. That's, that's, I love that and just the unlocking of the creative potential. So excited for that. There's two questions that we like asking our guests on the way out of the show. The first question is, do you think that we're in a simulation? Explain your question again to me. Do you think that this reality is a uh, simulation? So this is the Matrix-like question. <laughs> um, I, think it's a, I think it is simply because it doesn't have to exist. You know. Um, we live in the world as you see it right now is the world that white males made. There's proof, even the concept is self-admitting to say that there's a first world, second world, and a third world. And actually it's the other way around. Third world countries most likely are the first world countries. And so the, the simulation in, in my, from my perspective is the thought that America is a first world country when it's not a first world culture. So yes, I agree that it's a simulation. And would it be that the, the quote unquote, these third world um, countries, would it be that their moment to moment uh, adoration of existence is, that's why it's the, that's why that would be like the first world versus being caught in the economic machinery in the first world? Is that, or why would you select that the third world is actually the, first world no. because I mean just historically it, it was here first you know Africa was here first so all the perceptions of world and culture and people and humanity would have come from the first people mm. it's just simple mm. my my children know that I created them by virtue of just you know I've always been there so the first world has concepts of having been first that just it's, it's just it's just a matter of who's telling the story so I think there's a um, there's a pro African proverb that you know uh, when lions are historians, tales of the hunt will no longer favor the, the hunter. hunter. That's, That's it. it. Yeah. yeah, that's a great proverb. I like that one. Yeah. Okay, and then the last question is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Free, black people. Yeah. Even you like free black people. <laughs> <laughs> you just, it's just what it is. You, you, you love it. You love to see us doing what we do yeah. authentically, you know? Yeah. I always say the, the fist bump is much cooler than the high five. Look at that. That didn't even look cool. <laughs> you see? So us being free and, and, and you being able to interact with us in our most authentic selves, ultimately it relaxes you. You're like, oh, okay. So the more we interact, it's, it's going to be hard for a generation or two to have the pictures of us on the wall being what we are and listening to the music to then walk away and do what their fathers have done. I'm, I'm certain through time and, and osmosis of, the, of that interaction is that that won't, I think white kids are waking up and realizing that they've been lied to also. And... Um, it's happening. Yeah, it's happening. So that to me, that's the most beautiful thing in the world. I love it. I love it. This, this, in addition this, to, to my two daughters. The, in know, addition to the family and, yeah, and the daughters. Yeah. 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 The, I love this, the, the vision of what we see in like a United Nations where we have representation of people from Asia, people from Europe, people from Latin America, people from Africa, uh, women. Like when we see stuff like that in the cannabis industry or the uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency space, all these emerging markets that are happening, that's when we can tell that there's true equity of the fruits being distributed. 
I, I don't right. know about that because you know? okay. diversity is is an appearance. As, it, as when people use it right now, it's like a quota or an appearance. The true diversity is not people showing up and appearing. The true diversity is people show up as they are and do what they do and receive what they receive in an equitable way, yeah. not the appearance. Yes, because you can, totally. you can, you can, totally. you can place a bunch of people, people in the room there. and say, "Look, but look at our board." When look at, not, yeah, yeah, it's that's, the diversity that's picture. Correct. Of course, it's yeah. the white guy in I mean, Africa who takes it, the picture with the black children. He looks diversified, but he gets on a plane and he leaves. And whatever he created or whatever he did or people who look like him did, he leaves the situation as it is. So a lot of these companies are striving for diversity as a photo op. That's what, um, that's the, the caricature of the past and of the future is when it actually is all those people have roles that they're actually filling in a meritocracy in those positions. That would be, that's what as, that's in their, cool. in their, as their authentic, authentic selves, selves. Yeah. not as exactly. you know ceremonially uh, photo op yeah yes yeah. that's it all right. right. Thanks so See, much. This, is, rub, this right. has been so fun. What a great episode. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Check out the links in the bio to re-up and to Melik's work. Check out all of those links, everyone. Check out the links in the bio to New West Summit. Also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders in your communities that you believe in. Help them flourish. You can find all of our links below as well. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. All right. That's a wrap, guys. Good job. That was right, so man. fun. Appreciate that it. That was so fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.